Okay, we're on. Welcome to the slideshow for a Victory Garden, which is a permaculture site in North Carolina in the United States. This is a beginning permaculture site. This is a site that is without its lead designer right now. For those who are following my blog, I have recently moved to Finland. I live in Helsinki now, so this is definitely a little bit removed from the garden, but I spent two years there with my family uh, working to convert this from a typical suburban lawn to the beginning of a, fru a food forest. Um, you know, I saw the direction that the yard was going to take with these tall standard trees that are going to be shading out the grass, and I had the wonderful help of the books by David Jackie and Eric Tonsmeyer, the Edible Forest Gardens. And with armed with that knowledge, armed with that scientific approach to permaculture that they uh, so eloquently describe in both volumes, I was able to convince my family. I said, hey, look, this is going to be a forest anyway, no matter what you do. So how about we embrace that change and make it even more productive than you could ever imagine? So we set out on an amazing journey and... All without a permaculture design certificate. Uh, I still haven't taken one of those. I'm trying to save money to, but as an immigrant, I don't have quite the cash flow right now. So hopefully next year I'll be able to take one here in Finland and uh, get off the ground. But that's enough about me. Let's look at the site. This initial image, this is showing our end of the neighborhood. Our house is the center, the center house with the trees in the backyard. Um... It's about a half an acre, maybe a little bit more uh, fenced in. We definitely have more than a quarter acre. Quite a bit of property. Uh, this is a photo from, se not September, sorry, July 2010. Amazingly enough, Google managed to bring some satellite imagery right before we commenced the project, giving us that freeze frame in time to see the before and after effects. Um, quite a clear image too for Google Earth. Let me zoom in a little bit here and you can see that our yard is a lot like the other ones besides the trees scattered around. Uh, it, it was maintained similarly. Weed and feed, fertilizer, uh, cut you know on a weekly basis whether or not the grass needed or wanted it. Removal of all organic matter every single year not accumulating anything, although there were times that we would throw the leaves behind the fence instead of giving them to the city, but you know, not allowing the trees to build up the natural capital, not allowing the grass to build natural capital, so mismanaged ecologically. Um, but we're in the beginning stages of permaculture now, and things are changing. So let me flip over to our next photo. This is another satellite image. This is February 2012, the most recent image we have. It's not quite as clear. Taken later on in the day, you can see the shade that we have to contend with on this site. Uh, shade is a big issue here because we're actually on the north-facing slope of a hill. Uh, all of this, when you're looking towards the top of the screen, that's north. So even though we're in a mild climate, which is USDA 7B, uh, even though we only have a couple mild snowstorms a, a season, uh, we still can get frost as late as the 1st of May. We can get snow on Easter. That has happened before. So even though we're experimenting with permaculture, we do like to take things a little bit more on the easy side and you know, trying to stay safe. Um, our soil has been completely mismanaged as I said. It also doesn't help that when they build homes around here they strip off all the native topsoil and chuck it away so you're left with subsoil to begin with. Uh, so when you when you start off with a conventional approach we're really at nothing and we did some soil sample testing. North Carolina has free testing so if you're in North Carolina get in contact with your county extension agency Talk to them about getting your soil tested. Very great lab. Uh, one of the women who runs it is actually the wife of a professor who teaches permaculture at NC State. So, you know, they're right up our alley and they're going to give you some great 
information about your soil, um, definitely look into it. That helped us. Our phosphorus count was almost so low it, was, it wasn't readable. The same for everything else. Calcium, um, everything was just horrendously low, unfortunately. But that's what was expected. I wish it was a little bit better, but you know you have to start somewhere, and it's good to know that we're having these results with bad soil. So you can see in this picture here how it how it changed. Um, you know you would have expected our yard to look just like our neighbors to the right or the left of us, brown and dormant, nothing going on. But now you can see if you look closely enough. You can see swales, you can see pathways, you can see that the trees are mulched, you can see grain, things are growing. Cover crop was just just a trucking through the winter of 2011 to 2012. So now that you've seen the site from up top, uh, let's get into some actual photographs that I took uh, from the first winter. This is November 29th, so the end of November 2010. Um, you can see brown, dormant, nothing going on. But there is a little bit going on. Now that you're looking a little bit closer, you can see these orange pathways. Excuse me, these orange pathways are pine needles, pine straw that I raked up from our pine trees that are growing in our property and started playing around with the flow of humans, of resources in our yard, trying to figure out you know where would our beds be how uh, would they relate to the trees and their canopy uh, how close do we want to get to the trunks etc etc so uh, let's introduce you to some of the plants that are growing here already um, beyond the obvious pine trees in the back there they're actually an unknown variety. I'm not sure what they are. They're probably pretty common since they were planted by a developer, but they were planted as a screen so we wouldn't see that interstate highway throughout the year. Um, they don't do as good of a job as they would have if they were accompanied by the trees that, are beh that used to be behind the fence, but we can get to that story later. Let's start on the left-hand side. Left-hand side of the screen, the west side of our backyard here, you can see an ornamental plum. It's this dark, uh, dark colored tree, the short tree. It's right along the shade, right along the shadow of this deck railing. You can see where it starts. An ornamental plum planted just outside of that freeze uh, thaw, freeze thaw line, as you can see how distinct it is from the house. So it it sets a ton of flowers out and it blooms and actually makes quite a bit of fruit but of course it's very small and bitter and it's it's an ornamental tree it's beautiful though and you know even an ornamental tree is going to play host to beneficial organisms it's going to be working the soil for you so even if you don't have fruit trees if you don't have these productive trees that we're used to seeing uh, in a lot of these videos online, you know, don't don't count them out. Don't count them out. They might not be what you would desire, but you work with the conditions as they are, not as you wish them to be. And so behind this plum tree, the bright colored birch tree, there's two of these. They're river birches. They're native, and they tolerate wet conditions. So our clay soils that we have, you'll be seeing some of this clay soil here shortly. Um, they do a good job. They, they're a pioneer species, so they can tolerate this grass. But as you can see, all these trees are getting to that age where they're probably going to prefer a fungal soil over a bacterial soil. So we're catching everything right on this cusp of change, uh, which is just really great. We were right there with nature when it was just crying out and saying, look, if I'm going to make it to this next stage, I'm going to need some help. And so let's move over to the right hand side of this photograph and you can see the plastic tarp underneath there are two double dug beds that I planted some garlic in. And that's actually on a south facing berm. This berm was created by the developer with I guess just some excess topsoil in order to channel water runoff and I'll show you a better image of that in a, here in a minute. This 
other tree here, this really tall tree in the foreground on the right hand side is a willow oak. Again, it's a native, likes wet soil, so great for our clay and also great for its location. You'll see that I'm uh, beginning to think about digging a pond here and we did dig a pond there and it's just loving everything that we're doing to it. So let's move on to this next picture. This next picture is actually of the base of that willow oak tree. Uh, you can see one, two, three, four garlic plants growing right underneath uh, this, the crown of this tree. Uh, all deciduous trees, of course, are going to drop their leaves in the wintertime. So utilize that space. I knew, you know, totally new to permaculture, totally new to gardening. This is my first garden that I ever managed to grow from seed, harvest, and then get into another season with and actually be there with the garden. Uh, so as a beginner, I didn't want to do quite quite as much, and I didn't definitely didn't want to disturb the soil. So just in this mulch, compost, and everything else, I just put in a couple uh, cloves of garlic, and they came up. Moving this next picture, we can see the uh, little row house, hoop house that I made for the garlic in those beds. Uh, they grow in really well under there. I was really protective of everything when I first started. Didn't know too much. Uh, didn't really realize that that south facing slope was going to be that dramatic. I hadn't watched quite as many videos. I hadn't investigated too much about Sepp Holzer yet. Uh, so everything here is pretty standard. You would, you'd almost expect to see a garden look a little bit like that in a conventional garden. Uh, to the left of the plastic is uh, another double dug bed that I did, and that's actually running down the contour. I, I just wanted to see what the difference would be, uh, you know, by not digging it on contour. And I just transplanted white clover and dandelions and some other things into there just to see, you know, how they took transplanting in the beginning of fall, almost the onset of winter. You can see our bird dog in this photo. She's sniffing around, investigating everything that I'm doing, bringing in new smells. And right in front of her is a struggling raspberry plant. Behind her, you can't see it in this picture, it was actually a blueberry. And if you looked at her head, behind her head in, you can see a, uh, a blackberry bush. And none of these really did too well. We planted these before I knew anything about permaculture, before I even, you know, thought of permaculture as a viable system and so we just followed the instructions we were given by the nurseries hey dig a hole stick it in there you know put some mulch around it and it's gonna work well not so much so we've had to do some uh, rethinking with those plants and now you can also see the pine trees up close or a little bit closer at least from the last picture and at least they're not staggered at least they're staggered they're not planted in a straight line, so that makes it a little bit more interesting for uh, not only the eye, but in terms of possibilities with working with those trees. Moving to this next picture, uh, this is going to show you the slope that we're dealing with. Uh, I love working on a slope. Uh, you know, I used to think, hey, we should find the flattest area and put our garden there, but once you learn about permaculture and water harvest techniques, nothing beats having a slope. So from right to left, from the right, that's south facing. And from the right hand side, the water's gonna be trickling down, running down, and then see where the pink bucket is? That pink bucket is at the bottom of that slope. There's the berm to the left of it. So the water's gonna hit right around that pink bucket is, and it's gonna flow along that edge of this berm and out between these two birch trees. And when it rains on you know about a quarter of an acre for our lot and then our neighbor's lot drains into ours as well including her house including her driveway uh, and also including some of our front yard there is a lot of water that moves through this landscape when we do have a rain event especially considering the treatment of this land so there's no water infiltration almost yeah you know, 15 minutes after a storm begins from drizzle to the first heavy section of the rain there's almost like a flood going on back there and right where that pink bucket is there's a there's gonna be a pond there and there's gonna be other ponds I'm gonna try to slow this water down moving to another picture this is of the raised bed I was talking about it's got garlic and onions underneath it pretty standard stuff 
but unfortunately, as it's right next to the fence on the west-hand side, we don't get the afternoon sun there. So in the winter, it's almost useless. You can get a little bit of growth here, but you know it, it's not as good as it would be if it was full sun in the winter time. So we ended up cannibalizing this later on. Next photo here, this is showing our property that's actually behind our fence. Uh, to the left is the highway, to the right is our, our yard where the main garden is. In the foreground, you're looking at some compost piles, and that trailer is where I used uh, with my brother's SUV. We would go around, scoop up leaves before the city could get to them, and we would make these compost piles with some Starbucks coffee using local, well, I guess... You can't say the coffee's local, but instead of it going to the waste stream or going to somebody else's garden, I decided I would make some loops around the city and grab as much of this uh, wonderful nitrogen source as I could. Don't know much about composting. Still don't. And this is why. It's, it's a lot of work. These piles are 10 plus feet long. The longer one here on the left, that is a long pile. And turning all this just turned out to be a real pain. Uh, so... I'm more in favor of slow composting in place, chop and drop, mulching with these materials instead of breaking them down. Um, when it comes to vegetable scraps from the kitchen or anything else, we ended up having worm bins and we let the worms eat those a lot, a lot quicker than, uh, maybe it's not quite as quick, but I'd rather have the worms compost it than uh, you know, spending an hour or so turning piles. And as you can see, because we have a fence here on the right and there's a fence for the highway on the left, this is a wildlife corridor. Turkeys, uh, sometimes some quail, and quite a bit of deer come through here, which is a great reason why to have a privacy fence and have dogs because we don't have to worry about any deer coming into the main garden. Now we're going to go to some other pictures from the winter 2010-2011 and this is the 19th of January I now have a new camera it's a Pentax K7 and don't know much about photography these are right out of the box these are shot JPEG so I really couldn't edit them too much with uh, my editing program that I have which is Darktable uh, so we're just gonna have to do the first few months here without edited pictures unfortunately that means some of the details are going to be lost you're not going to be able to see much but it's going to get the point across uh, this is shot with a 18 to 55 millimeter lens uh, it's our kit lens that comes with pentax and just to let you know why i have a pentax not a canon or a, a sony or a nikon pentax weather seals their bodies and they offer weather sealed lenses so if I plan on being a permaculture designer I'd rather not worry if there's a sudden downpour comes on my camera equipment so in this picture you can see that I've definitely been doing uh, some reading when it comes to the edible forest gardens about swales and you'll see a glaring type 1 error dead center but let's get to that in a second here we'll start off from the right the right hand side uphill is our first swale, our upper swale. According to Edible Forest Gardens, you should dig them narrow and deep in clay soils, which works out well considering the amount of space we have to work with. I wouldn't want to have a massive swale that's going to fill up and, uh, you know, sort of diminish our growing space for plants that don't tolerate wet feet quite as well. And if you see at the bottom of the swale, so closer to the middle of the picture, and to the left you'll see a very small faint stick in the ground. And then if you keep following that line to the left, there's another one. And then where the second swale begins, there's a curve. There's a curve that keeps on going. That's where uh, the electric company and the cable company buried their lines. So I didn't want to interfere with anything like that so that's why the abrupt end to both of these swales which turns out to be a really really good thing um, that second swale is not on contour if you know anything about permaculture and if you've ever dug a swale before 
that is a type 1 error. Uh, I should have spent more time with the level out there, making sure it was you know, dead level because let's follow this line here from the center of the screen. It's going to flow down until you can see the swale emerge again. All that's going to accumulate right there at the center and that's going to cause quite a bit of stress on the downhill side of it. It's going to make it really boggy and you're risking the uh, you know, like a, a failure almost if we get too much rain because we can get some pretty big rain events and that's nothing you really want to have to happen ever. So, you know, make sure that you, when you're digging your swales, dig them level. Don't screw up like I did. Uh, so I had, I just created more work for myself in the end because I had to dig out the bottom of this swale part that's not on contour and try to level it out. It's still not completely level, but at least now water is seeping in um, closer to the viewer here in this picture. Not not as good as it should be, but I'm not going to be out there, you know, <laughs> trying to fix it at this point. I'm just glad that we made a mistake on a small scale rather than a big scale. All right, continuing on from there, as you continue down the slope, you can see behind the river birch, this is another river birch, uh, behind there you can see a excavation site that see the pale clay um, at the beginning of the berm that's where my first pond was being dug out I had never dug a pond before I'd always wanted to have a pond but I've never thought that you could just go out there and dig one but with our heavy clay soil you can you can dig ponds and not have to line them uh, you know, it's not sealed instantaneously. I don't have the machinery like Sepp Holzer does to uh, shake down everything and get it uh, compacted. But it's holding water uh, from the get-go. And in, after two years, uh, you'll see how we tried to introduce some organic matter to try to get a glay layer uh, forming on the bottom. It's holding water better than it did the year before. So I'm only uh, ever more optimistic that as time goes on, the weight of the water is going to be sealing these pores and we're going to be having a wonderful sealed pond there. But of course, it's fed by rainwater, so it, it is not going to be full all the time anyway, especially in a high evaporation uh, zone like we are. Now, moving on from that pond, if you follow the edge of the berm, so you're going down left from there, follow this dark line that leads you to what looks like there's another pond beginning to be dug out. And that is, that's another pond, that's our larger pond. It had more space to work with on the north side of that willow oak. So what was I doing with all that extra clay? Well, it's going to these uh, mounds that I'm building on the, on the berm. Moving to this next picture. This is showing the earthworks a little bit better. You can see, again, the second swale. That's the long uh, swale there cutting across the entire garden. That's obviously not on contour. You can see where it's dead level on the left-hand side and then how it just you know just begins to go uphill. I'm still kicking myself every day for making that mistake. But we're, we live, we're living with it and the garden's going regardless of that error. Uh, again, it's this isn't broad-scale permaculture, so you can afford to make some mistakes every once in a while and you learn from them and you hopefully you'll never make them again. I definitely... I'm going to be much more uh, precise as time goes on. This is also showing the future site of the big pond. And you can see that little ditch that's connecting both ponds together. The upper pond, of course, is this really light area on the top left. Um, that ditch between them, I dug that out, loosened it. I made it a little bit uh, you know, less, it's like more like a depression in between and you'll see some further earthworks that I tried to do to slow the water down as it overflows from that upper pond to get down to the second one. I wanted to slow the water down, make like a bog, semi-bog-like environment so I could put dynamic accumulators in to act as my last resort nutrient net. Um, moving on to this next picture, uh, you can definitely see the lack of skill with the camera. On this one, this picture is almost beyond repair. Again, shooting JPEG and not knowing what you're doing. 
but at least you can see what's happening here on the berm. We've taken off the plastic. It must have been a warm January day, letting the uh, the garlic get some action. Growing really well there, really strong. There's no fertilizer. It's just a tiny bit of compost on top with a little bit of leaf mulch. Nothing uh, that's going to be making some serious growth, but it's really good if you don't over-fertilize anyway. So I'm really happy with both of those beds. Behind them, you can see a mound that's got fresh dirt on it from all the digging that I've been doing. And you can see there's some uh, pine branches. See all these pine branches along the, uh, along the top of this berm. I've buried some already. I'm turning this into a mound here, semi culture and I intended on planting blueberries, and we did eventually plant blueberries. And on the upper right portion of the screen, you see the same thing happening again. I'm making some really long, low, uh, semi culture mounds. They're not great. I never didn't have a lot of wood to work with. Uh, again, not having a truck, it's sort of hard to bring in some of these materials that you want to work with when you see logs on the side of the road, people trying to get rid of things. Uh, so worked with what I had. All these branches came from the pine trees that I pruned up to about six and a half feet tall so I could actually get underneath them and also to allow more light in in the winter time. Uh, it's, it's a shame that there's so much shade there because in the winter that's a, that's a prime location to be growing some uh, winter crops. Moving to this next picture here, this is taken from the uh, extreme west end of our fenced in property and you can see how between those two birch trees, which are dead center in the in this photograph, how the slope drops off again, and the water is going to rush down here, and then it's going to go towards this blue trash can that's on your left and out underneath the fence. So it's almost like a ephemeral stream. Right along the uh, the fence line, you can see more of these long, sinuous mounds that I decided I would try to build. Um, those, unfortunately, have since been cut off from the rest of the garden by our temporary fence. Uh, but they actually grow quite a bit of uh, different types of dynamic accumulators and native plants and everything just all by themselves. And right behind the blue trash can is another mound with some hugo culture going on. I extended the berm. I extended this berm so I could have some loose soil to work with that's facing southwest. I wanted to have uh, an experimental southwestern facing aspect so just to see what could grow uh, facing that direction in our climate with loose soil. Moving on to another picture. This one here is just going to be capturing uh, some of those seed packets that we ordered from uh, seeds of change from Sustainable Seed Company and some seed packets from I think it's Botanical Interests. I bought those at a garden store in Tampa. Um, we've got a mix of vegetables, herbs, but we also have some perennials. We have perennials that are bee plants, they're nectary plants. We've got specialist plants like yarrow to bring in some of the parasitic wasp. It's also a dynamic accumulator. Uh, Echinacea, just a wonderful medicinal plant. Mexican tarragon, uh, since it's a wild marigold, uh, it should do a decent job fighting nematodes for us. Uh, top left hand corner of this picture, you can see our very standard agricultural uh, crops of nitrogen fixers. Uh, the first one on top left is a white Dutch clover that I wanted for the pathways. Uh, although we had a lot of clover already growing in the lawn, we needed some more seed. Uh, we didn't save any of the seed from the summertime uh, because, well, we didn't know about permaculture yet. So we ordered some white clover. We ordered red clover, which is a, another perennial clover. Uh, we also ordered crimson clover, which is just an awesome annual, fast, fast, fast growing legume. And the bees just love it, and it's spectacular. Um, and of course, since it's annual, yeah, it's not going to come back every year from the same plant, but with the vast amount of flowers it puts out, it's self-seeding. Uh, there's no reason why after you have one established crop that you just can't keep that going uh, through the years. And we also have some common vetch. So 
we're really focused on soil building, getting those dynamic accumulators in, getting the nitrogen naturally brought into the soil and setting off a accumulative stage uh, of organic matter because we didn't want to have to buy mulch and everything every single year. To me, that's not permaculture. Um, that's all. Let's start off with some more pictures from January. Moving to the next day, this is January 20th. Well, I see we're running over 30 minutes now, so I'm going to get through January 20th, and we will end this episode there, so we'll be about 40 minutes or so, I believe. Okay, let's take a look at this first shot here. This is shot during the day from my grandmother's deck. Um, if you restart this slideshow and you look at those satellite images again, we have an addition where my grandmother lives, uh, so we have all this extra decking and extra... Uh, housing, <laughs> you know, so by international standards, we, we definitely are living well. We're just a normal middle class family in the States. Um, this picture here, not too much has changed. I mean, it's only been a day, but uh, the lighting's a little bit better, and it's a little bit wider view, and you can just see that line, once again, of the shade that we're working with, and you can see how my pathways just sort of end where the shade begins, because I just don't want to deal with it. Getting to this next picture, here's our first swale. Here's that first swale that I dug. This one's actually managed to put it on contour, and it filled you know, readily from a storm, and I was happy to see that. Um, you, know, you can watch a million videos online, but to actually see it firsthand uh, with something that you did is just phenomenal. I love it. Next picture, this is taken from the eastern side of the house. You haven't seen this section yet of the garden. Uh, all of this in front of the swale gets so much shade in the afternoon, uh, but we decided to incorporate it into the garden and see what we could do with it. Um, again, you're seeing the form, the contours of this property and how everything kind of dips off to the left and there's almost like a, a small valley there. And you can also see the height of these trees. They're pretty tall. Uh, you can see the willow tree that's not doing very well at all. Um, but things changed for the better for this tree as well. It's, um, let's say, a success story from the last two years of permaculture. Here, again, we're seeing the second swale. And you're also seeing what's called... Well, I guess I'd be kind of wrong to call it check logs, but it's it's the idea of check logs uh, to slow down water without doing earthworks. Just I wanted to experiment with these different techniques and just get get my mind thinking about contours, about thinking about uh, forms that follow how the land wants to go and how water wants to move. Um, and again, you can see the excavation for the pond and here we're looking west uh, we're standing right on the downslope of the first swale you can see its berm on the bottom left corner of the screen and you can see those sticks that are showing where the, the cables are buried I'm not sure why they decided to run these cables all the way to the middle of our backyard and then back up but they did so that's what we have to work with um, you can see just how much space we're losing to the shade from the house, but it, we do need to have a little bit of lawn, a little bit of space. It's not going to be a forest garden because we do have dogs, and you do like to go outside and do things with grass every once in a while. Next picture, this again is showing the excavations for the ponds. Moving on again showing where the ponds are, showing the proximity to the willow oak. That's the willow oak here, right on the right-hand side of this photograph. That's the trunk of the willow. And you can just see this depression that I'm starting to carve out and turn into a, a large pond. Uh, the more water you can hold on your landscape, the better. The more uh, niches that open up when you have these edges between dry land, things that stay moist, like the bog between the two ponds. Uh, you just start opening up all these 
wonderful ecological tools that you can use to have a very resilient landscape. This picture here is showing one of the other blueberry mounds, and I'm, uh, you can see very, very clearly the stages of my mound building, of my hugoculture. You can see that I've laid out the boughs. I've, I've done this sinuous uh, shape between the, the trees so I could have all the different amounts of sunlight that I possibly could. Um, the boughs that are around the main mound here on the front hand side, I was just hoping that those would help prevent some of the wind from cooling off this hugoculture mound. I'm, there's not enough branches there to really do anything, but again, you're, I'm experimenting, I'm thinking differently, and I'm feeling free to try new ideas. You, there's no harm here in trying. Um, if you look closely at the left side of the mound, there's a little ditch. And I dug that out. Uh, it slopes down. I'm, I was hoping that it would help drainage for the mound. I'm not sure just how much it really does. But again, experiment. Try new things. Next picture, you can see the same mound from that earlier photograph. And now we're looking upslope. We're looking south. And we have quite a bit of space back here. There's a lot of room for growth here. Unfortunately, the canopy is already dominated, but it's not closed. The birch trees aren't offering full shade, so we can take advantage of this intermediary period between uh, sort of like open savanna and closed forest that's going on. We're catching this ecological succession at the right moment to begin building fertility for the long term while the solar energy is still reaching all this space we're going to suck it up and we're going to turn it into organic matter we are going to be thriving instead of watching these trees struggle as they mature next photograph just slightly to the right there again you're seeing our backyard um, not too many awesome things happening yet, but hey, you know, it's it's good to have a general idea, to have this record of what the site looked like before, because you will see as time goes on, these wide angle shots aren't going to show you quite as much, not as much detail, because they're being interrupted by plants. Now we're looking west. Uh, this is not the same blueberry mound. This is the western blueberry mound and you can see again the boughs from these pine trees that I've laid underneath them uh, I haven't stolen these from them I mean, sure I had to sacrifice some sap and I'm, I'm sure they didn't like being cut but at the same time it's you have to do a little bit of damage sometimes to uh, begin the healing process you know sort of set those bones this image here you can see the wonderful line between the two ponds, you can see the stepping of the pond. You can see how I'm beginning to use the clay and cover up the uh, pine boughs. And you can also see over the fence. You can see into the uh, my neighbor's yard, and you can see just how much of a slope she has. She's got quite a bit of a slope, and you know when it rains, we get water from her property like you wouldn't believe. Close up of those mounds that I'm building. Moving on to this next picture here. I like this angle of the garden because I'm capturing everything from the south end, the top of the slope. You can see all the way over to the west end of the property. And the contours of the land are readily visible. And I like the framing that the pine trees offer. You can see the stones that I've accumulated from digging out this pond. And this pond, I had this first pond, I wanted it to be as deep as possible, uh, as deep as I could really get it to hold that first flush of water. Uh, for some reason I had this brilliant idea that I would put a cinder block filled up with uh, some anaerobic, almost glay-like uh, substance that would help slow the water from seeping out. But I still wanted it to uh, seep through, down, and into this dugout area 
which I later on filled with some more soil so I could plant there and nobody would be tripping or anything. And I don't want to have a, a direct channel just moving the water. It needs to be slow. Uh, but that turns into like a little bridge. I like to think of it as a little footbridge. This picture here, uh, just this is our behind the fence area. This is showing you uh, just how much space we have to work with for our zone five. This is our zone five. It's not easy to get to. We don't have a proper gate, uh, sort of a hassle, poison ivy and everything back here. So uh, we don't get back there too often. Next picture, close up of the pond. Again, you're seeing the stepping that I've done. Not a great pond design really not good at all uh, could have done better but I was eager to get started and it is providing later on after you know this is filled up and we've we've got the garden going it's moderating the temperatures around there and it's reflecting sunlight up onto the berm here's a close-up of the second swale and look at look at our clay look at how dark red this is. This is a Udasol soil. It's very weathered. And as I told you, this is the subsoil. This isn't even what the topsoil should look like. And of course, since we've been stealing the organic matter constantly from it, it is just compacted. It is uh, pretty much dead. I would I'd characterize it as dead. Uh, there's quite a few earthworms, but they're not going more than a couple inches below uh, from the root zone of these of, of the grass because there's nothing there for them. There's no uh, real soil profile to take advantage of. Not a healthy one, anyway. Here's another image of the berm facing east. Uh, you can see the earthworks. You can see uh, just, again, this general gist of how our land actually looks. Here's a picture of the area by the plum tree. Uh, this area here has been abused quite a bit, uh, not only by, you know, dogs doing their thing, but also by the type of landscape management we did with cutting low uh, with the lawnmower and not allowing anything to build up. Uh, so a lot of healing that needs to go on here. And speaking of healing, look at look at this little garlic. I found this in one of the compost piles as I was... Uh, giving it a good turn, and it decided it was going to sprout for us. And I said, well, you know what? Let's see what we can do. And I said, let's take the warmest place I can think of. And the warmest place I can think of right now is this berm extension that I built. So I took it and another one that I found, and I planted them. And they're still growing there. Two years later, we're letting them just kind of grow wild. We have so much garlic now that... We just leave a lot of it in the ground and let it do its uh, do its thing, which, according to Edible Forest Gardens and according to a lot of permaculture people, is aromatic pest confusion. They're a very aromatic plant, so uh, wonderful to have those all over in the garden. Okay, well, that is the end of January 20th. You know what, let's go ahead and complete January so we can at least get most of this winter done. Uh, let's bear with me for a minute. All right, uh, I just had to get a glass of water. Uh, I just don't see how Paul Wheaton can just talk and talk and talk and talk. He's, he's got a real radio voice going on. Um, well, anyway, this is showing you the clay that I'm working with, how it doesn't want to break up, it's in clumps, it's in clods, it's uh, all these different colors. You, you can see in the actual pond area that I'm digging out how red it is, and then it'll suddenly shift and it'll be more of a tan color. Uh, you can see how the grass is just there on top and there isn't much organic matter more than a couple inches down. Uh, you can really see that in this photograph here, that there's not a lot of structuring going on. There's there's an accumulation of organic matter about an inch at the top there, and that's it. Continuing on, building these uh, Hugo Culture Mounds. I heard about these from Paul Wheaton 
Uh, he'd probably scream if he saw this. He'd say, that's not Yugo culture. That's, I don't know what the fuck that is. And I did say the F word because he loves the F word. And so do I. But I'm going to try not to use it quite as much as I normally do. Um, just to make this a little bit easier for people to listen to. Uh, <laughs> and so you can see these mounds are beginning to take shape. I'm beginning to cover up these boughs. I'm uh, working in some composted uh coffee grounds into them too to help with the nitrogen moving on to this picture here when I was out working I noticed a terrible disease of some kind had stricken our red maple tree you can just see how it's rotting it's falling apart there um, I was I immediately recognized that I, I must have had this uh, the leaf compost too close to the uh, the trunk of the tree so I pulled it back and I also did a little bit of Googling and I found that hydrogen peroxide, spray some hydrogen peroxide on there with, you know, diluted with water, try some vinegar, try some other things to try to slow and kill this disease. We really thought we'd lose this tree. You, It actually, it looks like there's an old scar there. This tree's been afflicted by this disease for probably at least one winter. So this is probably not the first time that it's broken up and just, you can see the inner wood of this trunk it's it's horrible um but this is another success story that we've had by uh going to permaculture with just a, about a week of treatment on there it began to you know subside a little bit dry out a little bit and we we're still worried about it but two years later we have not had the same problem i can tell you that 100 percent. it's gone the tree is healthier we have revived it um Going on to another picture here, it kind of looks like a manta ray. Look at the size of this pond that I'm digging out. It's not even done yet, uh, but I'm I'm digging, I'm digging, and digging. And what I'm trying to do is get the outline done, get the outline done, and then start stepping it. Still uh, working and making different uh, edges and niches within the pond itself. Okay, let's move on to. The next section of the pictures. Now we're on the 31st of January, so we're coming to a close right at about an hour, uh, which is excellent. Like I said, most of these won't be as long because I don't have all the introductory things to go over with you. Uh, but we're going to end it on a positive note of you build it and they will come. Uh, if you look closely at the center, you know, oh, it's okay, that's a muddy pond. But what are those? those are, there's some birds. They're actually coming in and taking a bath in the nastiest muddy water. Just a whole flock of robins are saying, what is going on back here? We have never seen this before. Uh, and this just was the beginning of the explosion of activity that we've had from birds. Birds are so interested in what is going on back here with all the different insects, the different plants and everything that they can perch on. Um, just lovely to be able to see it. Just an amazing experience it was. So that is going to conclude uh, the first part of this slideshow. I hope you've enjoyed it. And uh, we will be making the rest of the winter uh, probably next week. Hopefully I'll have time next week to put all that together. And we'll start off in February and we'll go through March, or at least the first half of March. And that'll bring us to early spring at a Victory Garden. So thank you for listening and I hope that this has uh, been worth your time. Thank you.